Our bodies sometimes behave in mysterious ways that we don't understand, especially when it comes to arousal. Why am I horny right now? Why aren't I horny right now? Genitals? What on earth are you doing? You're not my genitals. Damn, there's my genitals. This is exactly how I felt sometimes, just not understanding what my body was doing or the patterns in my arousal until I read Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, not Spawn. You can see how battered and bruised my copy is. I recommend this book a lot when people ask me questions about mismatched desires in a relationship, how to be more horny, how to be less horny, and why their genitals might respond in unexpected ways. So much just clicked for me when I read this book and I want you to benefit too. So in this video, we are going to talk about the secret to sexual arousal, AKA how to get turned on, AKA its official sexy name, the dual control model. Oh yeah, I can feel your heartbeat racing, the blood rushing to your genitals when you hear those words, the dual control model. Mm. If you're new here, hello, my name is Hannah, I make videos about sex and relationships, and please subscribe if you want to. No one is forced to do anything around here because consent is vital in all aspects of life. So the dual control method was developed in the 1990s by Eric Janssen and John Bancroft at the Kinsey Institute. It refers to two systems, the sexual excitation system and the sexual inhibition system, which in her book, Nagoski calls the sexual accelerator and the sexual break. Because sex drive, get it? Although not actually sex drive because in her book, Nagoski also talks about the myth of the sex drive and how it's a completely useless and unhelpful concept in understanding desire and arousal and we should just bin it entirely, but that's for another video. So before I give you the secret on how to get turned on, let's look at how our understanding of sexual arousal has changed over time, starting in the 1960s, because we all know sex didn't exist before the 1960s. <laughs> You may have heard of William Masters and Virginia Johnson. They're famous for their sexual studies in the 1960s, which involved monitoring people having sex and masturbating under lab conditions. They came up with the four phase model of sexual response, excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. Then in the 1970s, psychotherapist Helen Singer Kaplan realized that this model didn't apply to her patients who experienced little interest in sex the missing component was desire. She created the triphasic model of arousal. Desire, excitement, orgasm. Desire coming here before the excitement. The dual control model was developed in the late 90s and it describes not just what happens during arousal, but the central mechanism that governs and controls it. Say hello to your biggest sex organ, the brain. So you've got your central nervous system, which I know very little about. There's your sympathetic nervous system, which acts like an accelerator for bodily functions. Think fight or flight. And then your parasympathetic nervous system, which is like a brake and slows or inhibits certain bodily functions. So why not the same for sex? You've got a sexual excitation system or SES. This is your sexual accelerator and it is constantly scanning the world for sexually relevant stimuli even without us being consciously aware that it's doing it. When it notices something sexually relevant, this sends a signal from your brain to your genitals saying, turn on. Now, you might be thinking, what is sexually relevant stimuli? And that's a great question and we'll come to it later. At the same time, you've got your sexual inhibition system or SIS. This is your sexual break. This notices and responds to perceived external threats which prevent or halt arousal. And it also responds to internal stimuli such as fear, anxiety, or stress. You can still get aroused and have a good sexy time if this part of your break is active, but it'll just take longer. Everyone has a sexual accelerator and break, but how sensitive they are will vary from person to person. So a high SES is a sensitive accelerator and a low SIS is a not very sensitive break. Most people are average in both, but let's take a look at the extreme ends of the spectrum, which is still normal so that we can get a better idea of how this applies to real life. A small amount of people have high SES and low SIS, so 
a sensitive accelerator but a not very sensitive brake. They tend to get easily aroused, have difficulty preventing arousal, and are associated with sexual risk-taking and compulsiveness. Another small amount of people have high SIS and low SES, so a sensitive brake but a not very sensitive accelerator. They tend to have difficulty getting aroused, lack desire, maybe have difficulty getting to orgasm, and tend to be very aware of all of the possible reasons why not to be aroused. They tend to need concentration and deliberate attention to find pleasure in sex. Again, all of this is normal. People are just different, but we will get on to how you might change if you want to shortly. It's also important to know that the two systems are separate. So if getting aroused more easily is something that you want, first you need to figure out if it's because your SES is low or your SIS is high and focus on the right one. So how do you find out if you have a high, low or average SES and SIS? Well, our girl Emily has got us covered. There's a little quiz in her book called The Sexual Temperament Questionnaire. I love quizzes. When I first read this book, I did the quiz and I got my partner Dan to do it too. There's questions such as, unless things are just right, it is difficult for me to become sexually aroused. And often just how someone smells can be a turn on. And then you rank up your scores and you get a separate score for your SES and your S. Ah, yes. Also, it's been a few years since Dan and I took the questionnaire, and so we recorded a special podcast episode for patrons only of us going through the questions again, and you can listen to it over on patreon.com forward slash Hannah Witten. If you weren't finding this video sexually relevant so far, you will now, because that's what we're going to talk about. Your SES responds to things that are sexually relevant. That means sensations, what you see, touch, hear, smell, and taste and ideas. It can be internal feelings and sensations, such as wetness, an erection, or a sexual fantasy, or it can be social stimuli. A lot of what we think of as sexy is a social construct. It's not innate to our bodies and our sensations, but it's something that we learn. For example, that classic Diet Coke advert. A topless man isn't inherently sexual, but because of the context of the advert and everything that we've learned from society and culture about what sexy means, we read it as sexually relevant material. This means, yes, correct, almost anything can be sexually relevant. It just depends how much of a dirty mind you have. I'm joking. No shame here, but it's kind of true, but no judgment. If anything, I'm the one with the dirty mind because I read almost everything as sexually relevant. And by the way, sexually relevant doesn't mean something that turns you, specifically you, on. It's just something that your brain registers and goes, hmm, I think this is about sex. If you have high SES, you might not need much sexually relevant material to get going, which is why it might sometimes feel like you're literally getting turned on by anything. But just because you got super aroused after watching the final scene in the film Sausage Party doesn't mean you want to have sex with a hot dog. Although that's a bad example because that scene is basically porn and yes. I'm talking about myself. So here's some potentially sexually relevant things I found around my house. And these aren't necessarily going to turn you on, but your SES will notice them. So the secret to arousal, what on earth is it? How do I get turned on when I want to be turned on? The bad news is that we can't change the sensitivity of our sexual accelerator and brake. We tend to have a fixed range. But the good news is that we can control what they respond to. This is the part we do have control over. Nagoski calls this turning on the ons and turning off the offs. So our secret formula, what hits your accelerator? do more of that. What hits your brakes? 
Less of that. Easier said than done though. We can change what our brain considers a threat and we can also reduce potential threats like unwanted pregnancy, STIs and stress. We can also change what our brain considers sexually relevant and expose ourselves to more sexually relevant things. Now this is going to be very personal and very individual so it's all about tuning into your own context and environment. If you've experienced sexual trauma or you were raised in an environment that shames sex, you might have a lot more stuff hitting your brakes. You don't necessarily have more sensitive brakes, just a lot more stuff hitting them. This is going to be different for everyone. It really depends on what specific things are hitting your brakes and what you can do about them. But one thing that is true for most people is that stress hits our brakes. And I say most people because actually for some, it does the opposite, but again, it's all normal. So investing your time and energy into techniques that can help to reduce stress might be a good place to start. For example, exercise, breathing, mindfulness practice, meditation, and good sleep. Plus whatever else helps you wind down and relax. For your sexual accelerator, again, this is going to be different for everyone, but a good place to start is focusing on what sensations turn you on and doing more of that. So is there a specific scent that gets you in the mood? Is there a certain kind of touch that makes you tingle? Or is it a conversation with your partner that really makes you feel connected? Or maybe, just maybe, all you need to do is watch a clip of a cartoon taco going down on a cartoon hot dog bun. Thank you for watching. This video was brought to you by The Common Room, an amazing online community who helped to support these videos. If you'd like to check it out, you can head over to my Patreon and I will see you in my next video. Bye.